And lastly, Ander and Ramos. So we'll do the same thing of 10 minutes each and then move into a question time. And if you want to start, that would yeah. be fabulous. Well, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. I, I have to say I didn't prepare a talk because I thought on purpose I wanted to use these 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about my research and to give you a take on the questions we, we are asking ourselves. And this very morning when we put the first question, I was thinking, and my first reaction was to say, no, that's my immediate reaction. Do we want enhancement of humans and so on? And my first impulse is to say no. But as a scientist, I mean, I always like to leave the door open and say, well, maybe, I don't know. I'm open to new ideas. And <clears throat> why, why my first reaction was to say no? And I think somebody, Emilio, I think he mentioned this very briefly at some point, because we're the result of millions of years of evolution. So if things are the way they are, there might be a reason behind that. And it quite, quite can happen that when we try to enhance something, we are debilitating other things that we take for granted. So it's a very complex equilibrium that we have. And what I have is I'm open, but I'm also very cautious and humble because we are fighting against the end result of millions of years of evolution. And I work on memory, <clears throat> and the first thing that comes to mind when one talks about enhancements is memory enhancement. Do we want to remember more? We have to distinguish between enhancement and replacement. So for example, Alzheimer patients or amnesic patients, they don't remember things. And with these people, yeah, we want to do something. We want to help them. Even if it is just delaying the progression of Alzheimer's disease by a certain amount of time, that will be huge. And I think we're all on board that whatever we can do, I mean, we should try to do it. But now memory enhancement, no, actually, I don't want that. I don't want to remember more. And I will try to describe you some data of why I say that. But the main reason comes also from philosophical standpoints. I think one of the cornerstones of human intelligence, of what makes us human and unique in this planet, is the fact that we forget a lot. And we are very good at selectively forgetting a huge amount of information. We process very, very little information. And I think this is how our brain works. And I don't want to change that. I mean, I really want to forget a lot because by forgetting a lot, I'm able to focus on things that might be more essential, and that might boost my creativity and so on. <clears throat> Do you want to be faster? Do you want to react faster to things? It's, well, we're too slow. I mean, what about if we can bypass some of the circuits and we can react very fast to different stimuli? I also don't want to be fast. I mean, we're slow for a reason. And I hope I will be able to describe some data that will give you some hints. So we'll be much more concrete now. I mean, from philosophy, we go to real recordings. So since about 20 years, I do recordings of neurons in the human brain. That means individual neurons, not EEG or fMRI. We put electrodes since I, I don't do that, but surgeons put electrodes inside the brain. And this is done in patients. They're epileptic patients. And the reason for doing that is clinical. I mean, they try to see where the seizures come from and potentially resect the epileptic focus. So there's a clinical reason why these patients get electrodes implanted inside the brain. For clinical reason, these electrodes end up being most of the time in the hippocampus, which is an area that is well known to be involved in memory. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of technical details I'm not going to get into, but basically, through these electrodes, we can record the activity of multiple neurons, each of them, up to 100 neurons simultaneously or so. And <clears throat> they will do very simple experiments. For example, we just show pictures and see if any of the neurons we are recording respond to any of the pictures we're showing. And many years ago, doing this type of experiments, actually, when I started doing this experiment, I found a neuron that will fire to any picture of Jennifer Aniston and nothing else. So I show 87 pictures. Seven of these pictures were of Jennifer Aniston. The neuron fired to each of the seven pictures of Jennifer Aniston, and not to the 80 pictures of many other people. And that's what people in neuroscience now call the Jennifer Aniston neuron. I mean, that was the first one. <clears throat> and as I found the neuron firing to Jennifer Aniston, then I found many others. But an interesting fact was that the neuron was not firing to a picture specific about Jennifer Aniston. The neuron was firing to her, to the concept Jennifer Aniston. And that's why I started calling these concept cells. And because they fire to specific concepts. Then we carry on doing experiments, and then we found not only they fire to the pictures of a person, they can also fire to the name of the person. If we, I write the name, the neuron fires. If I write any other name, the neuron doesn't fire. And something that may sound trivial, but it's not trivial at all, they also, found, they also respond to the spoken name. If I say the name of a person, if I say Jennifer Aniston, the neuron will also fire. Completely different sensory modality, because now you are not seeing the stimulus, you are hearing the stimulus. 
<clears throat> then we did it a few sets of experiments showing basically, I mean, evaluating this further. And the message is that the neuron is not far into the stimulus itself, it's far into the meaning of the stimulus. It's not far into this picture or this other picture of Jennifer Aniston or Halle Berry or Oprah Winfrey, whoever it is that the neuron fires to. It's far into the concept. And it's kind of like detached from the sensory stimuli. So it's far into the meaning. <clears throat> Then we did a lot of experiments what, trying to find out why do we have these neurons. Well, this is the way we encode memories. We tend to remember concepts, abstractions. We tend to remember, I met this person in the Bakinter meeting in Madrid, and we talk about this. And you may forget, well, in my case, you may not forget the shirt I'm wearing and, and the exact words I'm saying and so on. So we tend to get rid of details. We tend to forget details and focus on essential things, focus on abstractions, on concepts, and make associations between concepts. So we had a few studies showing exactly how we do that, how we create these associations between concepts, and this is like the skeleton of our episodic memories, the memories from our past. And now I come, to, I come to the part that I found the most interesting. This is more like a philosophical crusade. I'm, I'm trying to go through since like a few years, recently, I mean, not, not that long, since 2019, most likely. And is is to show that the human brain works in a completely different way than what we think it does and that what we learn from other species. And I think we have a big philosophical bias in neuroscience that we tend to believe, at least implicitly, that some mechanisms that we study in rats with a lot of manipulations we can do, or in monkeys, they somehow extrapolate to humans. And we tend to believe like a memory mechanism that we find in rats or in monkeys will be similar, though a little bit more complex, in humans. Now, what I found really puzzling is, is a very simple observation. The human brain is not really that much larger than the chimpanzee brain. It's just three times larger. It's not like a million times larger. But we are way much more clever than chimpanzees, although chimpanzees are really clever. But I mean, we are much more intelligent than chimpanzees. So it's not something anatomical in the brain that is making the difference. It's that the brain is working in a different way. The principles underlying some processes, they are different. And the research we are doing these days in my lab is to show how some of these principles of memory storage, how we remember, they're exactly the opposite to what people have been describing in rats and in monkeys. The principle is called pattern separation. That's a technical term, basically, to say if you have some experiences with somebody you know here in Madrid, you will have a set of neurons encoding this memory. And if you meet this person, in Barcelona, you will have a different set of neurons. Why you want to have separate sets of neurons? Well, because you don't want to mix the memories. You want to avoid interference. And I think what we're showing in humans is that this principle doesn't hold. Actually, it doesn't make sense, because you cannot possibly have different sets of neurons for every experience you have with the people you know. You will run out of neurons. That's called combinatorial explosion. So what we are showing is that the principle of encoding memories in humans is much more abstract. It's not so specific to a con to a context like Madrid or Barcelona, you have neurons encoding a certain concept, like my friend Gustavo here. And the neurons finding to Gustavo will respond the same way if we are in Madrid or if we are in Barcelona, because are, these are the Gustavo neurons. So I'm able to abstract a concept, which is Gustavo, independent of the context. In rats, you don't see that. In rats, you see the opposite. The neurons fire into Gustavo in Madrid, there are a certain group of neurons, the neurons fire to Gustavo in Barcelona, there will be a different set of neurons. Now, if you work on computational modeling and so on, this separation is pretty bad if you want to do high-level functions like generalization, if you want to generalize, if you want to transfer knowledge across context. Now, if you have a context-independent representation, it's the best you can have for these high-level uh, functions, cognitive functions. And now I try to come back to the beginning. Why do we have these neurons? I mean, so far, nobody could find these neurons in any other species. And I put a challenge in writing in many papers. I said very clearly, nobody will ever find them. That's my bet. I'm betting a bottle of wine, very expensive wine, to whoever finds these neurons in monkeys or in rats. And I'm betting nobody will ever find them. I think they're exclusively human. And I think this is one of the cornerstones of human intelligence. And there's a, there's a key factor. And I will finish with, with this detail, which I think is key. When you study the monkey, similar area, the monkey hippocampus, the responses in the monkey hippocampus are at about 150 milliseconds. It's just a number. It takes 
a fraction of a second, and then the data gets into the hippocampus, you see the neuron responding. In humans, when you study the human hippocampus, the responses are double the time, are at 300 milliseconds. And you may say, well, the human brain is slower. No, it's not. The visual processing of the human brain is very similar to the one of the macaque brain. The, macaque brain. the timing is very similar. But from going from visual areas to the memory area, which is the hippocampus, in the monkey goes straight. In the human, takes double the time. Why is that? Well, because you spend all this extra time in extracting a meaning of what you are perceiving or what you are hearing or whatever. In the monkey, the sensory information goes into the memory system. The monkey will remember, will create memories based on the stimulus itself. We don't. We create memories based on our interpretation of the stimulus, the meaning we give to the stimulus. That takes time. That takes double the time. So, would I like to enhance cognitive functions to be faster? No, because if I, do, if I am faster, I'm losing one of the key aspects of, I mean, human cognition, which is the ability to think and to remember in terms of concepts, of abstractions. Would I like to remember more? No, because I don't want to remember too many details or too many things that will actually preclude me from extracting just the essential information and create some associations and maybe having the basis of, of our creativity and our intelligence. And with this, I think I finish. Thank you. Thank you.